Tales from the Reset. Bunker 20. I'm starting to lose my mind. First, it was the deafening silence that was only occasionally broken by the vibrations from the air filtration unit. Depending on the room, the whirling of the fans would either increase or decrease in volume, yet the vibrations always remained constant. Without another soul to talk to, the hollow affliction of loneliness crept in, causing me to be haphazardly thrown into weeping fits of a gloomy hopelessness where all I accomplished were hours of sobbing. Some days were better than others. But one solid fact that grounded me to reality was the mountain of rock hanging right above me. Buried deep into the side of the Appalachian mountain range was my fortified home, Bunker 20. One moment it felt like a bastion of salvation, while at others, it was nothing more than an arduous prison. I know I'm safe from whatever nonsense is going on outside the bunker, in whatever barbaric state of society any survivors have mangled together, but keeping this place habitable is a fucking chore. They designed this bunker to comfortably contain about 40 people for a year. Yet here I am, constantly scrambling around, making sure that all the life support systems can keep me breathing. I might be exaggerating a bit. It's not like I spend every waking minute of the day running maintenance on all the equipment. However, when something does finally go wrong, it does so in disastrous fashion. Thankfully, there are plenty of binders and manuals for every aspect of this facility to help keep everything operational. Consequently, it means very little to me as it's all written far beyond my comprehension. It's like showing hieroglyphics to a caveman. Every time an alarm goes off, that means I'll spend hours trying to find the right booklet, and then many more hours reading through it while attempting to make the blinky lights and that annoying buzzer turn off. I feel as though I'm just slamming a wrench, beating hunks of metal until shit finally works again. The absolute worst thing in this entire place is that damn claw machine. I've been here for months, and I have yet to master that damn contraption. Among all the potential distractions in the recreation room, nothing has captivated my attention more than that dastardly machine has. There was nothing unique about it. Sure, it had flashing lights and played sound effects, but the only special quality it held was being in the bunker in the first place. For all I knew, someone could have installed it here as a joke, destined to drive whomever dedicated their free time playing it past the brink of insanity. It took everything in me not to destroy the damn thing, but I wouldn't allow it to get the better of me. All it took was a single quarter to bring the contraption to life for a mere 30 seconds. One quarter and 30 seconds of each day was all I could ration for this mindless entertainment. As with every other valuable resource in the bunker, change was a rare commodity that wouldn't be replenished anytime soon, so I had to use what little I found sparingly. Provided I stuck to one play once a day, I calculated that I could hone my prize-grabbing skills for at least five months. The thought of opening the claw machine and taking out the spent quarters passed through my mind, although my previous attempt to do so on the Galaxy Blaster pinball machine made me think otherwise. Before the claw machine became my obsession, I spent my free time on an excessively loud and flashy pinball cabinet. In my first couple weeks spent in the bunker, I would spend hours listening to the bumpers pop against the rolling steel ball as a synthesized beat blasted from the speakers. Over time, I became so connected with the device that while I was playing, I viewed it as an extension of my own body, the flippers mentally tied to my muscle memory becoming mechanical additions to my thumbs. Without a doubt, the cabinet was manufactured as a game of skill, where through repetition and diligence, the act of engagement could allow the art to be honed to a masterful peak of perfection. After multiple sessions, I felt that my performance at the game had hit a plateau, although I never felt I wasted my time practicing. I turned a single coin into hours of entertainment, allowing me to forget about solitary life deep inside the mountain. The sad reality was that in order to learn the game well enough to play with any kind of consistency required that my first several dozen attempts be short-lived with relatively low high scores. Upon putting my last coin and losing the game sooner than I expected to, I discovered I was out of quarters. Instinctively, I tried opening the machine's money compartment only to learn that it needed a key. There was a half-hearted attempt at searching for it in the administration office and maintenance room, but I found a crowbar first. 
Using it, I pried open the small door at the front of the cabinet, revealing a tray where the coins were collected. Through forcing my way into the machine, I had set off a security switch that had disabled it from being played again. Each time I set a coin into the machine, the LED screen at the head of the cabinet would display an air code with the following phrase, Maintenance Requested, in a bold red dotted font. I wasted hours, if not days, trying to fix the pinball cabinet to no avail. The damage was permanent because of my lack of understanding and brutish attempt to retrieve my money. Try as I might, I couldn't find a single manual on the machine that would help me repair it, not to mention the fact that while doing a self-diagnostic, I did not know what I was even looking at. Eventually, I gave up as the extra time spent fixing it was better maintaining the rest of the facility. Much like a corpse in the morgue, I covered the machine with a sheet from one of the bedrooms so I wouldn't have to see it anymore and be reminded of my foolishness, rather than out of respect. If anything positive can be said about that experience, at least it taught me a valuable lesson, not to force myself into arenas unprepared. It taught me to ration the resources I had and to properly account for the future. When I finally moved on to the claw machine, I did so knowing that my time spent with it would be limited. As prepared as I might have been, the crane game was its own beast, designed inside and out to make any auspicious player obsessive. Where the pinball machine was a game based on skills that could be improved, the claw machine was one of chance where victory was random. Over many weeks, I was able to steady my aim, aligning the gantry perfectly just to have the grabbing mechanism on the claw fail to engage. The prizes were nothing of note, a bunch of stuffed animals ranging from furry bears to feathery ducks. What little skill could be attained by playing the game only assisted in selecting the physical prize, while well, whether the machine would grab it was left to an unknown yet infallible probability. Victory wasn't contingent on the prize that fell through the chute. Rather, it was the affirmation that flesh could conquer machinery. Ultimately, the machine would always win. I knew that. Whatever emotional rush I felt upon successfully grabbing onto a stuffed bear was entirely dictated by an outcome of mathematical happenstance the circuitry was premeditated to deliver. It was nothing more than a gamble, where I fought the odds, resulting in a futile enterprise as I became emotionally invested and dependent on an arbitrary result. The joy I received from winning was only just enough to surpass what aggravation I felt from the numerous losses. Pointless as it may have been, I couldn't stop playing. Talking to myself became as natural as any other inconspicuous habit, like breathing while asleep or blinking to avoid my eyes drying out. I became my only friend, the only soul to confide with my deeper thoughts, the only ears to listen. I realized the claw machine had established an unhealthy addiction when I would repeatedly argue with myself over continuing to play. Not playing would have definitely have helped soothe my fractured mental state, allowing me to find healthier, more productive things to obsess over. After much deliberation, I agreed to stop playing the machine after one more win. A lie I told myself far too many times. Once I managed to grab onto a plump felt chicken, I was fully prepared to unplug the claw machine and walk away for good. Until a small glimmer of metal shined from the floor of the play area where the stuffed bird used to reside. There, in the middle of the machine, was a silverish key tied to a foam corn cob key ring slightly larger than my thumb. Rather than debate over what the key was for, I figured that one more game wouldn't hurt. Obviously, I could have used the crowbar to smash the glass and just pick it up, but I viewed the opportunity as one last battle against the machine, and I was determined not to let it win. With only nine coins remaining, I had only nine days, nine chances to win the utmost valuable prize in the entire cabinet. I spent the following next few days as any other. Wake up, eat, hear an alarm go off, wander the bunker looking for something to fix with binders in hand and tool bags slung over my shoulder, yell at whatever hunk of metal was giving me strife, magically repair said device enough to stop the alarms, eat again, play the claw machine, go to sleep, rinse and repeat. On the morning of my fifth attempt at capturing the corncob key ring, I was met with an alarm I was wholly unfamiliar with. Opposed to the incessant, low, repetitive, trumpet-like buzzing accompanied by the deep, red flashing lights, there was a short, high-pitched chime that echoed the empty hallways. 
The sound emanated from a single room instead of ringing throughout the complex. Curiosity got the better of me, so I ignored my daily routine and searched for the source of the new sound. As I crept through the halls, I would stand still for a moment as I awaited for the sound to ring again. When it went off, I would walk towards what I assumed was the direction it came from, followed by another momentary pause to hear it again. By the time I made it close enough to greatly pick up in volume, I found myself quickly dashing through parts of the bunker I rarely, if ever, treaded. The chiming came from a dark room close to the bunker's entrance. I frantically brushed my hands on the walls looking for the switch to the overhead lights and once illuminated discovered that the room was mostly occupied by a large control panel. On the dashboard, next to faint flickering lights, dials, knobs, and switches, was mounted a microphone with a large red button at its base. Two large speakers were fixated where the control panel met the corners of the room that periodically rang out the high-pitched chime. The wall in front of the control panel had a large plexiglass window that peered to the large steel door that served as a threshold to the outside world. Rolling an office chair out from its tucked position in front of the mic, I sat down with the otherworldly contraption before me. I had no idea how this thing worked. Just glancing at it, I became overwhelmed with just how complex and busy the whole setup was. Operating this was a far cry from simply adjusting the crane of the claw machine or hitting flippers on the pinball cabinet. In the center of the dash was a display. I peered over it, trying to find the right button to turn it on, and after several failed attempts, found it was powered by turning one of the dials along its right side. With a satisfactory click, the display slowly warmed to life, showing a very dated display of text. External input received. Allow entry. Could this mean there were people outside? It had to. Someone outside the bunker had to put in the code to get inside. But why was it asking for my permission to allow them entry? Surely if someone had the code, the system would just open the door for them. But what if that's not how the bunker's security worked? Hell if I knew. I wasn't even supposed to be here, so it was no wonder that I didn't have the faintest clue on how this place was properly run. Then I recalled the guy who brought me here in the first place. It had been so long since I had any thought outside of the alarms and the machines in the recreation room that I gradually forgot about anything else. When the reset hit, and everything outside became so chaotic, I was the lucky soul that just so happened to be camping in just the right location. What little I knew about what happened was from a few news updates before my cell battery died. And as I made my way back into town, I met him at the park crossing to the main road. Never bothered to get his name. Or did I? He probably told me. But after all this time, I never cared to remember. All I did was go off his word that it wasn't safe to go back into town, and if I wanted any chance of survival, I would help him. I had nothing left to lose and no home to go back to, so it took little convincing. But he left. Why? Why, after dragging me here, did he leave? Was it something about family? Yeah, I think that was it. He brought me here to help him secure the bunker and left for his family. Why were they not with him in the first place? I sat pondering for a long while, with the chime ringing every couple of minutes. It was as though a part of me was coming back to life. The thought I wouldn't be alone anymore. The very idea of seeing another human face nearly brought tears to my eyes. A lump grew in my throat as I fought my surfacing emotions. All rational thought went out the window. If it was him or someone else, didn't matter. The only thing that mattered in that moment was not being alone anymore. I desperately analyzed every label on the control panel, looking for a way to confirm opening the door. I saw a red cover with a dusty label, Access, above it, slightly scratched out. Flipping the cover up, I came upon what looked like a sizable spring-operated plunger button with a keyhole. The chime sounded again, along with a flash on the display, pestering me to reply. All I needed was a key to unlock the mechanism to engage the button, which would then send a confirming signal that allowed the door to open. At least that was my best assumption, considering I knew nothing about the inner workings of the control panel. I scanned around the room for where the key might be hiding. There were six drawers under the dashboard, three on each side, yet my frantic exploration produced no results. 
Off the top of my head, the only place in the facility I knew I would find keys was in the admin office. The people buzzing in the intercom had already waited for a while. What difference did it make if they waited a little longer? With a spring in my step, I hurried over to the administration room. As I rummaged across the surfaces of the desks and pillaged through drawers, I found nothing of use. I could have sworn that keys were in there despite never actually seeing them in the room. The last time I panicked over keys, I was desperately trying to get into the pinball machine. Had I ever actually seen a key the entire time I was living here? Yes. Once. The very idea that once I unlocked the door, I would be met with another human face was enough to give me a complex mix of joy and anxiety. It didn't matter who was on the other side. Anyone would be welcome company after so many months left in solitude. Still, I had to prepare myself, just in case the person on the other side of the door had devilish intentions. When I arrived at the recreation room, I quickly grabbed the crowbar left near the pinball cabinet, then made my way to the claw machine. Raising the crowbar steady with both hands, I readied myself to strike swiftly against the glass. Before I could swing, there was an abrupt moment where I reflected on breaking into the machine. I had a few quarters left, so I could easily play a couple rounds attempting to win the corncob keychain the old-fashioned way. In doing so, there was the possibility of beating the game with the ultimate prize during the most critical of moments. It would have been the sweetest of victories, a crescendo to symphonize my superiority over the device that crippled much of my sanity. With my last few attempts, I would know undoubtedly that my skills were fine-tuned enough to prove my talents outmatched a random number generator. An exploit to champion such a dismal accomplishment. No, I said to my blurred reflection in the glass, this is how I win. With the greatest amount of force I could muster, I swung the crowbar, sending my reflection to shatter into many sharp, fractured pieces that rained in every direction. The game never cared if I won or lost, as its prime directive was to encourage me to continuously feed it money. The only way to truly conquer a system designed to enslave the mind of its captive audience was to dismantle it, to disassemble it, to destroy it. By crushing the very existence of such a hypnotastical structure, I brought down the very means of power and control it had over me. No more would I allow myself to willingly participate in a game destined to rule over my emotions, letting them get the better of me. I might have gotten a little carried away when I realized I continued to swing several more times, bashing and denting parts of the machine that weren't in the way of myself and the key. Taking a quick breather to collect myself, I gave a chuckle at just how ludicrous everything was about the claw machine. It definitely gave me something to do. A daily goal to attain for making each day just a tiny bit easier during my isolation. For that, I thanked it. But for everything else, it could burn in hell. Once I had the spongy foam keychain in hand, I smiled at the brilliant metal key it was attached to. With the key firmly in my grasp in one hand and the crowbar in the other, I headed back to the bunker's entrance, ready to finally address whomever was requesting entrance inside. Although I highly doubted the curved bar of metal would readily aid me in self-defense, it was better to be prepared than empty-handed. Even the slightest show of force was better than appearing completely defenseless. The chime went off once more as I positioned myself in front of the panel. I placed the key into the keyway and gave a firm turn, setting the plunger to its unlocked position. An unintentional belt of laughter erupted as it left me astounded that the key actually worked. After a few deep breaths to steady my nerves, I looked through the plexiglass and at this large steel door. The anticipation of what waited on the other side made my heart race, but with the alternative being an indefinite extension to my loneliness, I pushed the plunger down, completing the circuit. The display flashed a confirmation of my acceptance, and the door opened. Mm -hmm.